live. I tried doing this on Instagram first, but Instagram was not having it. So here I am on YouTube. And uh, so today we are going to be talking about the upcoming new moon in Scorpio, opposite, opposite of Uranus in Taurus. And we are also going to be talking about this very, very powerful Yod or Yod, finger of fate, which involves Therios, Eris, the North Node, and also Mars, Typhon, and Ceres, and other things. And I know that sounds like a lot, so I'm going to distill it as best I can. Now, new moons are very powerful times for seed setting. Uh, these are times for us to really be looking at what patterns we want to change. <laughs> ah, hang on. Let me just see what notifications have suddenly come through. Some random person tried to call me right now. I have no idea why, but okay. Um, <laughs> let's get to that. So, um, new moons are effectively times for us to effect to set seeds. This is a time where we need to look at what it is we want to change, what it is we want to do, how it is we want to be, and to set intentions for how we want to change this in the future. So, if you were to look at what a new moon is about, it's about that. It's seed setting. You know, sometimes you, you've got to, for certain seeds, you've got to make sure that the soil covers them and they're in a dark space for them to germinate. So it's that kind of, uh, it's that kind of thing. Shin says, put on, put, put on do not disturb P. I probably should do that, but I don't know how to do that whilst I'm live. So for next time. Having said that, the new moon in Scorpio is all about the kinds of seeds that we need to set when we think about power, when we think about authority when we think about how we interact and engage with others in an intimate capacity, how we share assets with others, essentially speaking. And it covers a lot of things. Scorpio covers a lot. Finances is a big one. Alimony, inheritances. It also deals with health. It also deals with, um, with, with surgeries on, uh, on the same token. It also deals with intimate partnerships. It also deals with investments and other people's money. And at the end of the day, what binds all of this stuff together is Scorpio's ability to control. Because when you have power, you can control. You can have power over the other. Effectively, that is what is at the heart of many, many Scorpionic lessons. And when it comes to the individual, it is often, very often seen as power over your own fears, power over your own shadow. Now, when you look at things from a more holistic, naturalistic you could also include shamanistic perspective. Power in this context doesn't necessarily have anything to do with oppressing somebody else. It means the power to exert your own inner discipline and not getting caught up in attachments, control dramas, or anything of the sort, and to realize what is yours is yours and what is another person's is another person's. But people and even nations playing out Scorpio dynamics can often forget these lessons. So when you look at it from this perspective, the new moon in Scorpio is asking all of us individually and at a planetary level to look at where we are engaged in imbalanced power dynamics in various areas of life. And of course, Scorpio also does deal with weapons of war. So when it comes to what is happening in the Middle East, I am not feeling too optimistic because of this. Now, this new moon in Scorpio is also opposed to Uranus. Uranus is the great awakener. And the thing about Uranus is that it is a wild card. You don't know how it's going to do its job. On the one hand, uh, you know, lightning hitting the sea can create life, yes. But on the other hand, lightning hitting the wrong part of your house can also burn it down. True, this could mean that you are then free to pursue something else somewhere else that you like, but there is also that discomfort, that pain, that shock of that initial fire. And so Uranus can get the job done, but it's not always going to do it in the most pleasant way possible. And Uranus and Taurus is all about our revelations. It is all about our awakening. It is also about our, in the sign of Taurus, it is about how we realize our spirituality and our, so to speak, higher consciousness is intimately wedded with our material choices and incarnations on this planet. And because of what is happening in the Middle East, people are being encouraged to boycott, 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 which I find is a very good thing because on the one hand it shows people the interconnectedness between industry economics and politics and on the other hand it is making people think about what do i eat where does this come from what does that support 
I mean, and for people who are looking for a more intellectual analysis of what is going on in, in the Middle East right now, just follow the money. You will find out who's behind all of this if you actually follow the money. So having said that, there is this mass awakening that is underway that is forcing us to realize that being part of an embodied awakening meat sack of consciousness also means taking into account your impact on the environment and how that environment has been human handled in the name of capitalism, profit and greed. So that awakening is happening, but it's just not necessarily happening in the most pleasant of ways. And bringing this back down in the individual level, it can also be a time where you can experience significant breakdowns or breakthroughs. Or maybe you could call a breakdown a delayed breakthrough. That's one way of looking at it. In the various areas that Scorpio and Taurus both touch upon. So there is this element of pure wild cardness. Either it is a red flag for health for some people. It is also a red flag, especially if you have unsafe electric or electronic appliances in your home. Do not be tinkering about it with this stuff at this time. Make sure it is in a safe location. If you can prevent harm from coming to yourself and your loved ones, even better. But in a positive sense, this is also a time where more and more people who often through social media will be coming to an awareness of the topics that I've very, very lightly touched upon here. All of us have a, have a voice. All of us have a very, very powerful voice, and that's not about how much you know. It's not about what degrees you have. It's not about how far you've traveled into the spiritual universe. Your voice is powerful because it represents a particular truth in the here and now. And the way people are moved is not so much by facts and figures, but by passion. By passion, by authenticity, and by the light in a person's eyes when they say something to you. And that is something that will always remain true, no matter how much technology humanity kind of puts in the way in our connection to other human beings. So this is a time where people are also going to be seeing the power of their own voice as Taurus is very connected to this area, this part of the body. And this is a time where people are going to be encouraged to speak. And hopefully, hopefully this massive transition that we are all experiencing will be as graceful and as loving as possible. That is the big hope for all of it. But that is the new moon. As I said, wild card, don't take any weird physical risks unless you absolutely have to. And if so, make sure you take adequate precautions. The other side of what is happening whilst these immense planetary changes are happening is a mega yod involving Therius the hunter stalker in late Virgo, Eris the goddess of chaos, discord and war, and the north node in Aries, and also in the third corner, we've in the sign of Scorpio, we've got Mars, Ceres, Typhon. And when you put all the three together, what you get is a very powerful yod or finger of fate, which points you in a certain direction. And he says, this is the way you got to go. This is what you got to do. This particular yod form between you've got, let's say you've got uh, Therius and Virgo here. It's sextiles, this cluster in Mars, and they both point upwards to the north node in Eris, which also means the midpoint of the sextile is, is the south node for those who are looking at that. So what does that mean in English? It means that at this time, we are asked to embody, we are asked to awaken, we are asked to be true to that spark of consciousness, which is the truth of who we are. And that is not an intellectual concept. It's not even an emotional concept. It is something that doesn't have any words for it. But you can basically call it that spark of consciousness that makes you who you are. And this is the time where all of those sparks need to be absolutely lit. But there are dangers to doing this. There are costs to doing this. And that is what this particular yod reminds us of. So when we have a yod involving the North Node and Eris, first of all, there's an issue. Eris, for better or worse, whether you take her side of the story or not, Eris invites war. Eris invites chaos. In, she invites discord. Ultimately, she burns down the patriarchy, but with a lot of collateral damage. And we just need to look at the tens of thousands of people getting killed to know exactly where that is focused on at this time. So when we see the North Node and Eris in conjunct Therius the Hunter-Stalker, what that means is in the, um, what that means is in terms of this awakening process, we need to look at where our help is the most needed. And what we can do 
it is a sustainable way to provide that help. There is no point of you burning out in the name of the greater good. Because if you are burnt out, you can't do jack shit for anybody else. There is no point in you throwing yourself in harm's way because your voice will not then be there to speak. So this is a time to find very sustainable ways to perform acts of service, acts of healing that actually help yourself and those around you. This is not something that anyone can fix by their lonesome. We transform the energies of consciousness on this planet by first working on ourselves and by linking with others who are working towards a similar goal. At this time, the most powerful tool you have is your voice. So use it for something good. Use it for something kind. But then there is the extreme. There are some people who feel like they need to insulate themselves from whatever is happening because it's low frequency, it's not spiritual, it's ba 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 the material world, to which I would say, why the heck did you take up space and resources and incarnate if you were not going to respect this planet in the first place? But that would be my particular view on things. If you are here, Respect the land, respect the earth, respect the people on it, respect the animals, respect the, the, the rocks and the trees and the minerals. This is part and parcel of being here. You are not separate from anything that exists in this biosphere. And that includes people. So insulating yourself from that is also not terribly spiritual in my book. It's just another excuse for escapism, which more often than not masks privilege and even more colonial structures that do need to be dismantled. That's one extreme of it. The other extreme is the martyr. Now, I don't mean to disrespect anyone's religion, but from spiritual experience, looking at the way spiritually has evolved over time, martyrdom does not help. It does not change the energy of situation or of the planet. The more innocence are lost, we do not then rise in frequency. We actually just deepen the issues that exist here. We add so much more burden, so much more guilt, so much more weight to the situation that exists when we say some people are expendable because it serves the greater good. That doesn't work. That has not worked. And so people do need to move out of this martyrdom complex for those of you who are in alignment with the frequencies and energies now. And like I said, not meaning to diss anybody, but that is my perspective on things. So that is what Therius teaches us and warns us when it comes to this income that it's having with the North Node and Eris. And bear in mind, there can be a lot of explosive energies. People can be lashing out, especially if they have given too much. So you need to make sure that you are also not giving too much of yourself in the name of something good. But if you're giving nothing at all, you are not in balance. Now, the third part, the third part of it is, of course, the connection that comes through Scorpio. Now, if you are a member of my tier 23 program, you know that I've already said this. There's going to be massive seismic activity. And in fact, in Iceland, they had 1,000, 1,000 earthquakes in a single day. And, the, and not all of them were tiny. One was 4.8. So that, that country is now in a state of emergency, as we are seeing, Mama Gaia literally erupt in different ways. And of course, there are larger esoteric things that link the geology of, uh, or rather the, the geology of, the, of the, the great rift that Iceland is part of, but that is in itself a different way of the planet communicating with us. So if you are living in areas of, of high seismic activity, you would be best to just be a little bit more on a, a little bit more aware of what's going on in your local area. That part, I don't have the resources to predict exactly where it hits. It might just be Iceland, or we may also be seeing more seismic activity over the planet in the next few days. And part of that is also, in terms of the astrology, indicated through this yacht. Typhon and Scorpio, Typhon being the great serpentine monster in Greek mythology, um, is effectively an energy that can also bring up a lot of tremors, even in ancestral lines and intergenerational issues. So you may be seeing a lot of old, old, old patterns of trauma and pain coming up through ancestral lines that have yet to be cleared. And this is work that if you've been following me, you know I have been consistently talking about this for the past 10 years. Do that work. That work is part of your spiritual work. You don't need to practice ancestral worship if that is not your path, but you do need to make sure that 
your relationship with them is clarified, however that is. For some people, they're not part of their lives. And for other people, it's a big, big part of their lives. It depends on what your tradition is, but do that work if you haven't done so already. There is also a very general watch your health, you know, kind of red flag in the air because of Mars also aspecting Uranus at the same time. And it also includes not just your physical health, but also your mental health and wellness. And that can be, right now, it is just very overwhelming for so many people. And not just because of what's happening in the Middle East, because it's happening in so many other places. Sudan, Congo, Armenia, Tigray, Ukraine, these are still places where there's immense conflict going on and sensitive people are feeling it. No matter how much you want to deny it, it's happening. And people are feeling the pressure. So it is very, very important to also practice self-care alongside doing what you can. You need to do both. You need to absolutely do both. Because if you can't do both, you might as well just sit on a blanket fort somewhere. Self-care and however you do embodied activism at this time, in whatever capacity you see fit. They both go hand in hand and they cannot be neglected. So when you look at these together, these yard points and positions, you can see the, the importance of paying attention to these details. So I understand and, and, and just <laughs> I do see a lot of people here and I just want to say a quick hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions with respect to this, um, ask it now. Otherwise, I can then bring this to a close. I may know. So do we have any questions on the material that we've covered so far. Uh, will this live be saved? Yes, it will be saved and it will be re-uploaded again as a live premiere so more people can view it. Shin, can you define ancestral work? Not to be cheeky, but Google it. It's a huge subject and you need to start doing your research. I can't, I can't answer that in the scope of, of, of a very small life. So start reading. There's more than enough people that have started writing about this. So it is a, a good idea to start reading that. And if you have a specific question, I'd be happy to help you if I have the qualifications to do so. Um, Michi asks, Crystal to help at this time. Okay, Crystal to help at this time. It depends what your situation is. For people who are still hiding in the, their heads in the sand, black obsidian. For people who are looking at the abyss a little too closely, you need something a little bit more carnelian. Carnelian for people who are already doing a little too much. Black obsidian for people who are not pulling their weight. Um, I hope that helps. Kelsey asks, what ancestral, now this I can answer, what ancestral work is one to do when their ancestors were mostly colonizers? This is a very, very good question, and thank you so much for this question. See, to be honest, one of the reasons why I do not pedestalize anybody, like anybody, is because if you look back at any culture's history, you will find patterns of oppression. Anybody. You know? So you will find patterns of oppression, you will find patterns where there have been imbalances, and those get also get transmitted through generational lines. Now the difference when, when you talk about colonization, it's, it goes beyond that. It is when you systematically take land, take culture, take language, take identity. It goes far, far, far beyond, say, a war between two neighboring tribes or even two, two neighboring nations. Colonization is a completely different experience. And when you have that kind of, and to be fair, my own bloodline is one that deals with brown colonizers because brown people can be colonizers too. Uh, if, if the oral history that was imparted to me was correct, my bloodline goes back to the Cholas who effectively colonized Southeast Asia. And I can say that because I've done the work and I've looked at these ancestors and gone, so are we still on the same page or are you just going to keep sitting in that frequency? So when you have colonizers in your bloodline, and, it, and again, that, e that cuts across race and ethnicity, you have to confront them. 
you absolutely have to confront them. Now, whether you are a shamanic practitioner or whether you do other types of energy work, you literally have to call them up and go, look, this is my road, this is your road. Either you evolve and realize that what you have done is not okay and I am not going to carry your bullshit, or we are going in two different directions and you are not permitted access to me. It sometimes comes down to that. What you will also find in ancestral lines that are colonial um, is that very often, especially if they have come to power or especially if they have, in, a, in almost a bizarre way, conquered a lot of territory, you will also find the presence of various deals that the ancestors have made. And those deals pass to their descendants unless you actually say, not my monkey, not my circus. So you actually have to confront all of these and basically carve out a path for yourself if they are not willing to let go of those control dramas and let go of that lust for power or greed, which tends to be what drives colonization. And so that's the work that needs to be done. And it's not easy work. You literally have to look them in the eye sometimes and go, what are you doing? And can we cooperate or not? So I hope that answers your question. So it does take some experience with that kind of work. Um, so I don't know if you do that for yourself, but you know, work with someone who knows what they're doing on this subject. And so I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Kelty Star says, thank you, you're most welcome. Michi, I hope your question got answered. Uh, for grounding crystals, really depends on what each person needs, really. Uh, <laughs> a general grounding crystal. I'm drawn to yellow jasper at this time. Yellow jasper is what I'd recommend in general. Um, any other questions? Let me know. You're most welcome, Kelsey. I am glad I could help. Uh, the ancestor question is a, is a question that a lot of people have because they're just some people that totally pedestalize them and you know and other people who don't so priscilla says happy diwali from a fellow virgo moon in the third house <laughs> happy diwali to you priscilla um and i hope you have a good celebration <laughs> um and michi says tell the kitties i said hey i had to wait a long time for josh to calm down first Skir says hey i noticed sarah's at 24 scorpio for the new moon will that play into it Ah, you caught me, Chris. You caught me. Well, Ceres does play a role. And I was wondering to myself, should I or should I not get too deep into this or not? Which is why I just went, ah, maybe not. But thank you. And since you've caught me out, I will talk about it. So yes, Ceres does play a role in the new moon. And it does also play a role in the yod with the north node Eris and Typhon and uh, their use and so on and so forth. And let me explain how. So Ceres is mother nurturer, yes. Ceres is also mother's mother. Because there are different ways that you can read the Persephone myth. Of course, you can see the myth as someone going, my daughter, I must have her, she's, she's, you know, she's, she's my child, she's been kidnapped and so on and so forth. And that's how she gets Persephone back for six months of the year. She basically holds the earth hostage. But the other reading, and this is a reading I personally more um, resonate with, is that Persephone does not actually seem like she was that unhappy in the underworld, if you actually look at it, because she was co-regent. And yet, if you're telling me a co-regent of the underworld um, did not know that eating there was going to keep her there for six months, that, that does not fly. And if you look, and, and from what I've seen with Ceres in practice, um, Ceres in practice also and very often tends to refer to when the mother nurturer figure tends to be controlling to the point of being the devouring mother rather than the nurturing mother. And Shin, Shin's like, 
taking a jab at me, not going deep in Sophia's season, we want to hear it. Well, I, yeah, I didn't know how deep you wanted, okay? I gave the floor and fine. Um, but effectively, when we look at, <laughs> when we look at Ceres in, in Scorpio, we look at claims that are effectively made on your assets, your resources, your life force your the the boundaries that you have in your intimacy you also look at the energies that surround your sexual organs and the meridians that connect that which at least from tcm are highly connected to ancestral energies in the first place so ceres is effectively for me she's effectively that claim that one makes with that pedestal of i nurtured you i own you you gotta do what i say which is also how she holds the earth hostage i give life you don't do what I say, you don't get it. And in certain situations, that can be very, very appropriate, all right, in certain situations. But in other situations, it can be a wild violation of energy. Now, the reason why I was not saying anything about Ceres is because I know when I open my mouth on something, I'm going to have to speak the truth of it. And I'm going to speak the truth of it, of how I think it plays out in Palestine, because that's been what's on my mind. I have Palestine on my mind. So if we were to actually get using that as an example, in this situation, what the claim that people are making, on the one hand, it appears to be a claim, one side is making a claim of land, a claim of nurture, a claim of ancestry, and the other side is making a claim based on sheer power and the ability to take. These are also very, very distorted manifestations of Ceres and Scorpio. And one of the things that we actually see, what the energy that is beneath all of these claims is very much the energy of something black and something very liquid. And I'll give you a clue. It's, well, that's already the clue. You're going to find oil. The claim is that effectively, what they're really looking for is oil and natural gas, but they are framing their claims either in terms of ownership by way of nurture, ownership by way of land, ownership by way of I've made this, I've built this, I do this. But what's actually being sought for is something a lot more gross and a lot more greedy. So in that sense, that is how it, uh, it, it effectively plays out. So that's how I'm seeing this. And at a personal level, it is claims that are inappropriate in other aspects of your life. Now, if you are fortunate enough to have Ceres in your life in a beneficial way, then it's nurture. But not everybody has that fortune. So that's why you would have to look at this. And I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's see. I don't know how to pronounce his name, sorry. Any supplements you recommend for... You've written mediating, but I think you mean meditating. Um, it depends why, if you if you are being distracted from meditating, it really de it really depends on why. You know, if you have a lot of restlessness, for example, um, if you are very very fatigued, for example, you might be supported by something like, and you have to do your own research on this. I am not a qualified herbalist. But, you know, do your own research and check in with a qualified naturopath or herbalist. Um, obviously, the vit vitamin E comes up, the omega-3s comes up, vitamin B comes up, B complex in particular, B12, if you want to be very, very specific, because they deal with the nervous system. And if you have a wide variety of potential symptoms that are just preventing you from sitting and calming down, then maybe you might want to look at it from that perspective. Um, magnesium is also very, very recommended for mood and nerves. So that is something that you can use. There are also stuff like, as Shin has put, Corella, Spirulina, Anemia, 10 Mushroom Brand. These are all good things, but you also have to look at what your personal allergies are. You also have to look at whether or not these are good for you because different people may have different issues. And the most general thing I can tell you and the safest thing I can tell you is stick to the B vitamins. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, the Halls of Amenti asks, what makes earthquakes more possible now? Typhon. Typhon in Scorpio, um, which is pretty much opposite. The, uh, it is uh, conjunct the new moon. It's opposite Uranus. It's uh, conjunct Mars. Whenever Typhon is activated, we see a lot more seismic activations as well. Um, 
Shin says, yes, absolutely. There are many different ones, just personally for me. Thank you for sharing. I just have to say that because it is a public forum, and I just want to remind people that not one, what works for one person isn't going to work for everybody else, and that is okay. Um, and at the end of the day, also just follow your intuition because your body does know. Your body does know what it needs, and if you begin to trust your intuition more, you know, if you feel drawn to something, look at it, and you might be surprised. That might be exactly what you need. Um, but just on the safe side, B vitamins. Um, let's see, any other questions? It's turning out to be a good life. Any good questions? And Chris mentions, wow, it's happening at 24 degrees Scorpio, my natal moon too. No wonder you asked. <laughs> Don't get into any kind of weird sacrificial codependent BS, Chris. Avoid it. Doesn't matter who says what. If anyone's trying to hook you into some pattern of dependency, walk the other way. Doesn't matter who it is. Living family member, ancestor, don't know, don't care. Move. Because if you don't, things are going to be erupting with that North Node and Eris conjunction. So do we have any other questions? Let me know. Let me know. Okay. All right. So I think that's a wrap. So take care, everyone. Lots of love to all of you. I hope this uh, live has been useful. And, uh, oh, okay. Watchman, who's also a, a, a lovely friend who is into astrology, says the descending node of Mars is at 20 degrees of Scorpio. Why don't you share what you feel that that's going to imply for everyone? Uh, Chris says, I might have to book a reading. It's been a while. It has. And, and yes, sessions are, of course, still on. Um, I don't offer them as many days as I used to just to also conserve my own energy. But you can always book a session. The slots are open right now. And right now is a really, really good time to get perspective on things, especially if you felt like you don't know how to quite connect the dots together. Because one of the things is no matter who you are, no matter what you know, an outsider always has a higher chance of seeing the solution, even though it's, especially if it's been under your nose the whole time. So sometimes we just need someone else to look at something. We just need a little bit of, of, a, of a nudge to, to, to connect the dots on. Michi says, Mars is squared my ascendant. Oh, Michi, what are you going to do? <laughs> There's nothing to cry about, Michi. Nothing to cry about. Just don't get too excited on things. Uh, the halts of Amiti says, I had a question. Go ahead. Waiting for the question. <laughs> and in the meantime, I'm also, let me see if I can type in the link. Hang on. So I'm still waiting for the question. I'm going to see if I can just type out the link for those of you who would be interested in booking a reading at this very, very important time. Um, let's see. Michi said, oh, no wonder you asked about grounding. You should have asked, asked if it was for you. For you, Michi, ma Mahogany Obsidian. That's what I would recommend for you, Mahogany Obsidian. Be a specific woman. <laughs> Paul Collins says, you haven't explained the fact I was watching the black cat before I saw you just now. That is probably one for the universe, Paul. I don't know how to explain that one. Though my little Josh, who is a black cat, yelled and yelled and yelled for about half an hour so we had to wait for him to calm down before i could do this so you probably were drawn in by josh's yelling i thought he was communicating with someone <laughs> so we're still waiting for the question let's see and l'oreal <laughs> you knew it i knew he was talking to somebody Let's see. Okay, so for those of you who are interested either in the tier 23 program, and be, believe me, I spend like hours on that. You get hours and hours of content per month and thousands and thousands and thousands of words and detail write up. They survive it <laughs> in a good way though. Um, hang on. So this is where you can book that all sessions. Here we go. I got the link. 
Michi wants to know how am I doing today? Uh, how am I doing today? Hmm. Well, I made sure my brother and I had a nice breakfast. Um, woke up at about five, did more digging on new stuff on Gaza and the recent UN vote which was all about preventing illegal settlements to be built. And of course, Canada and the US and Israel said no. Um, but I was looking at that and, you know, for me, political activism is, is, a, is a thing. Um, and I spent a long time looking at the little kitties, which is good, which helps. And uh, now I'm here, so. But as for me, I am doing reasonably okay. I am trying to slowly, slowly, slowly get my mobility back so it was uh it's it's been it's been hard that area has been hard but i try and i keep trying um chiron wants to know what was for breakfast don't judge me don't judge me but i had a spanish latte and something called portuguese egg tarts which is uh which is and this is something if you ever come and visit malaysia you'll notice how much colonial crossovers happen in terms of food um, Portuguese egg tarts were originally from, you know, it was a, a Portuguese dish which got Malaysianized. So uh, I had that and it was actually really delicious. It tasted more like a lovely vanilla cream puff. And I was really happy about it because I wanted to get something nice for me and my brother today. So we had coffee and we had some nice tarts for breakfast. Do not judge. So... <laughs> That was for breakfast. Um, and uh, yeah, though early in the morning, I had eggplants and chili. And I woke up because I was hungry. So I already had like a proper meal then. So it was more like light tea brunch. I don't know. But uh, yes, but it's good to see all of you. Keep your voices alive. Keep going forwards. Keep doing good things. And let's hope we make a beautiful world. You know, let's hope we make a beautiful world. There was actually something I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, okay. Chiron says, I have mostly eaten pizza for 24 hours, so who am I to judge? What kind of pizza, Chiron? What kind? <laughs> Why didn't I get any? Um, <laughs> Michi says, indeed, thank you for being here. I came here to be here. Yep. Hope you did. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I did want to talk about, and since, you know, we've got a good crowd here, um, one of the things I did want to talk about was, I mean, I've been talking about what's happening with my brother, and, you know, we are doing our best to raise awareness online and so on and so forth. Pepperoni pizza, very nice. Um, and um, one of the things that hits me so hard is that, you know, I'm a fan of various geekdoms or is it nerddoms, I don't know, like Lord of the Rings, like uh, Star Wars, Harry Potter, you know, anyone my age has uh... huh? melatonin? Is that a pizza topping? I'm kidding. I, obviously, I know what melatonin is, but, you know, if that's a question, let me know what it is. Um, so effectively it's, uh, what was I going to say? So I'm a, I'm a fan of various fandoms and what I feel rather dismayed by, even though so much of the, so many people, millions of people are kind of lit right now with the awareness that there are gross injustices happening and we've got to do something about it. I noticed that people in the fandoms are not doing things, you know, as like when I, and, you know, just looking at some of the video and the footage. Uh, coming out, I think about stuff like Boba Fett and um, and uh, if you've watched the book of Boba Fett, there's a scene where you see the massacre of the kids at the Tuscan Raiders. And I looked at that and I looked at this and I'm like, I can't be the only person who is reminded of this. And I look at people just blithely, even from the Star Wars fandom, they keep sharing Order 66 like it was nothing, but there is a real Order 66 happening right now in the world. And, you know, um, so, yeah, why are people not saying this? I mean, yes, we 
we kind of valorize these two little hobbits fighting against the odds, little people doing great things in the world. And yet we see a whole bunch of effectively olive growing hobbits on mass migration, forced migration out of their homes. And the fandoms are not saying anything. This is something that I just didn't understand. And I still don't understand it. I think about Optimus Prime and I think, what would he do in this situation? He'd be sitting there in Palestine. And of course, if you look at real life heroes, I look at Fred Rogers and I think about what would he be doing? He would be sitting there with those kids. I don't wanna talk about too much of the horrors that I've been following on the news from the journalists on the ground, but these are the things I'm thinking about. Why are we not engaging more people? Why are people who literally spend their lives in love with characters who are heroic, who are powerful, who stand for justice, not doing a damn thing, and yet are just using the energies of the fandom to further, you know, to further isolate themselves? What is the point of loving Superman and Batman if you are not going to stand up and do your little part when you can actually be a hero? So then that's something I've been thinking about. Um, Ohen and Anna says, we are waiting for your question. Yes, we are. I'm still waiting for your question, man. I'm going to log off in a sec. Kelsey Star says, some people want to depersonalize the injustice by placing it in the fictional universe, I guess. I guess, you know, and this is the thing. Art, whether you call it high art or low art, it's meant to inspire you. And it's not just meant to inspire you so you sit somewhere cutely and you don't do anything, you know. I, like for me, Optimus Prime was, was a big part of my moral compass growing up. she was part of a big part of my moral compass growing up. Neither of those people would be neutral right now, you know? And in fact, and this is a horrifying comparison, and I will mention this. Yesterday, Al Shifa Hospital was bombed by a missile called the Hellfire Missile. Literally, that's the name. It's not even something that explodes, but it has blades that are six feet six feet in length just to cut people up and they did this near a hospital and here's the thing on my instagram feed i saw there was a, an old trailer of um an all an old an old trailer of one of the optimus prime movies and they showed megatron and and and, and prime fighting and megatron's missile was exactly the same thing literally was shooting the same kind of missile and i'm thinking to myself i can't be the only person who looks at that and goes that's the same fucking missile i can't be the only person who sees this but people in the fandoms are not speaking but that is something that has been weighing on my mind quite a bit and like like kelsey said they just want to depersonalize the injustice but as shin says wwopd what would Optimus Prime do? Optimus Prime would be standing there. He would be there. Shoulder to shoulder to any real hero we think about. <laughs> but, you know, we don't need to do that. We just need to keep our voices open. We need to keep speaking the truth. And we need to hope for a greater humanity. And... Uh, Kelsey says it's hard when you have no superpowers and no superhero comes to make the happy ending like movies. Every day people feel helpless, I think. And I saw this person talking about this and I found it very encouraging. She's a, I, you know what, I should have put her name up, but she is a Muslim woman in London who basically does mass marketing. And so she has studied the strategies of how people advertise and make you buy shit. And so she used that same analytical framework to show people how one narrative of genocide was being sold to people through mass media outlets and how, another narr how that narrative was broken by journalists on the ground. And she said, millions have been spent to make you doubt yourself, to make you believe that you have to say nothing to be neutral. Millions have been spent to make you silent because they are afraid of your voice because your voice has power if you as because your voice has power they basically have to allocate millions to silence you now i'm paraphrasing but i looked at that and i went yeah because i felt that hopelessness too i felt that hopelessness too i felt like what can i do and the thing is i can do something you can do something we can do something if we remember 
we have power. Now, the halls of Lamenti asked, when will the energy lighten up? I knew someone was going to ask this question. It won't, honey. It's not going to lighten up for a few years at least. And, you know, if you've been following me for a while, you know, I call this in, I mean, I know people have been calling this for a while, but from my side, um, uh, I've been calling this out from nearly the start of my public work. It's not going to get good anytime soon because this is a war. This is a fight for consciousness and it's not going to be gentle because so many people are still holding on to the old. Uh, like I said, follow the money. Where there's oil, where there's sales of armaments, where there are bought politicians, that is where you're going to find the greatest resistance. Um, and not going to light it up anytime. We have to fight for it. And Michi says, hmm, Shin says, marketing is the reason I don't listen to the radio when I'm driving to inspire you to shop more. But this particular woman was very, very intelligent in the sense that she showed how we were being sold a particular way of seeing things and how we need to change the language to actually be more effective. And, you know, Kelsey, if you're on Instagram, just send me a DM and it's the Skype Priestess on Instagram and I'll send you a link and hopefully that'll make you feel better as well. Wasn't planning on this to be a hello neighbor, but I'm glad it kind of turned out to be one because it's been a while anyway. Um, oh, Chris says, my notes are 23 Gemini and Sag. Sextile and Quinchunks. <laughs> The transiting notes, I'm feeling it. Oh, you poor man. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You'll get through this. Now, don't forget, Therius is, is squaring. In fact, worse than that, Therius is squaring both of those positions. So, you know, and of course, that is an, actually a grand mutable cross if you include Neptune. So you got more to worry about. Book in that session soon. We probably need to talk. So, having said that, I hear lightning in the sky, or rather thunder in the sky is lightning nearby. I am going to wrap this up. Thank you all for your attention. Um, lots of love to you. Keep shining that light. Keep being that voice and being true to you. Paul says, I will go back to watching the Black Cat film soon. All the best and all the best to you, Paul. And if you like movies, because I did see your comment, watch Black Cat, White Cat, or it may be White Cat, Black Cat. I'm not sure which order it is, but it's a very, very, it's a, it's a powerful movie from Eastern Europe. So check that out. You'll probably like it. Um, <laughs> so take care. Very many blessings to all of you. And cha-cha for now. We are in this together. Bye.